Yeah, I guess I feel somewhat responsible for some of Glenn's uh, burnout because I probably wrote about five or 600 of those articles that he's been reading on climate change uh, as well as a number of other issues. So it was kind of a, a big review of many things I've written about in the past, well, I guess 21 years now. I've been freelancing, covering environmental issues around the world. As I was introduced, I've been to these big uh, UN talk fests in the last five years. And I want to start with... Um, 2009, which was Copenhagen, where actually I did some interviews with Bill McKibben uh, back then. But the thing I wanted to tell you about was there was this sort of moment in that giant hall where all the countries are there and, I don't know, 10,000 people. And there was this scientist that I recognized, uh, uh, Professor Schell Schellen Huber. I think I'm still pronouncing it wrong, but he's the uh, lead uh, scientist in Germany on climate change. He advises the Chancellor, he advises the European Union. And so this was a unique opportunity just to have a quick chat with him. And he looked kind of glum and I said, so, you know, and the negotiation's not going well. And he said, well, it's not about the negotiations. I just, you know, spent the morning briefing the Obama administration on climate science. And I said, oh, well, that's great. They're taking some opinions from outside of their own circle. And he said, yeah, it wasn't so great. They kept saying to me, yes, but what you're talking about is not politically realistic. Give us something that's politically realistic. So there was this complete clash of worldviews, I suppose. The science that says physics doesn't care about politics if the climate's going to warm based on some very well understood principles. But the political advisors are saying, yeah, but how can we finesse this? How can we negotiate a less extreme uh, action plan? So as a result, as everybody knows, I guess by now, the Copenhagen Ag Accord Agreement was the politically realistic, not the scientifically realistic one. And that's been the case ever since. Uh, that, that, that hasn't changed. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that many key political leaders actually know what the science is. They've been briefed. They have, you know, what they are struggling with is to find ways to completely revolutionize our economic and our way of lives so that they can meet the needs of the science in terms of keeping climate change to the least damaging amount. Not, not all countries, of course, go along with that particular philosophy. Um, some are outright deniers. Some have many vested interests in preventing any uh, action on climate change, or indeed a strong UN climate treaty. And the UN process works under consensus. So everyone has to agree to whatever treaty that's going to come out in 2015 in Paris. So back to Copenhagen. So Copenhagen went for many, many hours over time and nearly didn't achieve it, any result at all because there were many countries, some of the small island states, that said, what we have agreed to here in this accord is not enough. This will not save our countries. A few other countries, of course, said, no, no, there's no way we're ever going to sign on to something that's more uh, acquiring bigger emission cuts. So in the end, there was those last minute compromises and fudges, and we'll review it again at the next meeting, as happens in these big international meetings. So they conclude, because they always got to have a result at the end. Everybody's exhausted. They've been up for 48 hours. It's a big, big, big problem for small countries, because they've only got one or two delegates. The delegates from big countries will have 100, 200, and they can do shifts. So that's how it ended in 2009. Since then, much of the progress, if you can even call it progress, is in wordsmithing and fleshing out what has become the most complicated treaty in human history. It's not a treaty yet, but it's negotiations for a treaty. So these guys meet all the time. There was two weeks of meetings just in June in Bonn. 
So they're still discussing many, many complicated aspects of, th of this future treaty. What is the upshot going to be? That's, that's really hard to predict at this time. But there is some positive note that I hadn't seen in the previous four years. So Obama making the small move on the power plants in the US to reduce emissions from coal plants is probably the biggest step the US has taken since Copenhagen. It's not nearly enough to actually uh, meet the needs of, of staying below two degrees. Um, but it's a step, and it's a first step by one country that will trigger steps by other countries. So it's this, this, this sort of weird dance of who goes first on cuts. It says, I don't want to go first because I'm worried, because there's still this perverse belief that economic interest of your country preempts the climate. So all the people who go there to negotiate these things believe, and this is often their marching orders from higher levels within their own government, that yeah, yeah, you can agree to anything as long as it doesn't affect our short-term economic interests. However, that's you know, framed amongst, each country has its own uh, way of figuring out what that is. So the end result is, yeah, yeah, the climate science is there, but don't agree to anything that might, might hurt our economy. So that has led to the stalemate these last four years where people are saying, well, I don't know. I don't want to take a big step here because I might be at an economic disadvantage by putting a price on carbon, for instance. But that's starting to shift. There's a growing awareness amongst many countries coming from as much from the public, from the, from the science, that the shift to low carbon, economies is actually smarter, cheaper, you can actually make money doing this. Germany is probably a good example. And people are beginning to finally see that. And so that's part of the reason why there's a shift at the international level. More and more countries, especially developing countries, are really keen on getting alternative energy. It's cheaper, easier to do, requires a lot less technology, um, and they can roll it out quicker than they can do something like building a nuclear plant. So there's, there's, there's definitely some progress in that, that respect. So here we are coming up to July. There are still behind the scenes talks going on between groups of countries trying to prepare for the New York summit. So this is a summit where the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has made it very clear that he wants to see commitments to reduce emissions that are in line with the science. Normally, you know, folks at these UN meetings just like to talk, nice talks, and they don't like to make commitments. So he's pushing really hard for this. Now, the, the, the Secretary General has no power. He just has moral suasion and, and a public platform. So it's good, and it's something. There's that move by the US, Chinese are doing some stuff as well. They're banning a lot of their coal plants now, and they said they're not going to build new ones in many parts of their country. They're shifting to uh, renewable forms of energy. So there's some changes. So there's a lot of pressure on the big emitters especially to, do, to make commitments in New York, which is in September. That's all part of this move towards a climate treaty in 2015. So the process is New York, September, you make commitments, you say we're going to do 35% cut by 2020, which is maybe something like the U European Union would be prepared to do that, maybe 40%. And then the next bit is how do we get everybody else to move along in the same, uh, same way? How, how, do we get, how do we get all the other countries to also make similar commitments? Because Again, the European Union, if they say this 40% by 2020 cut, they're going to say there are going to be conditions if everybody else moves along at the same time. Not necessarily 40%, but within some parameter of something that's in kind, an, 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 an effort that is in kind. And that is how a lot of these uh, 
uh, commitments will be framed. They'll all be framed like, sure, yeah, we'll do this, but you guys got to do something too. So then it gets the post-September New York period is thrashing out, okay, what are you guys going to do? So when it comes to the next climate COP in Lima in December, that's where other countries will say, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. And from that period, December of this year through to Paris for the final meeting is working on all the nasty, messy details of who's going to do what, how much, when, and how you're going to check to make sure they're actually doing what they said they're going to do. This is verification, mitigation. It is a very, very complicated treaty, as I've said before. Uh, the language, if you go to one of those meetings, you would not know what they're talking about. It's extraordinarily technical. You'd never know what's talked about climate change. Sounds like a trade deal. Because it's very legalistic, lots of lawyers involved, uh, lots of policy wonks. It's, it's not, not even, even the scientists, there's hardly any science, there's no science really involved in that. And even the scientists don't know what's going on because it's completely a different world for them. So that's our framing. So we get to 2015, we get the Paris Agreement. Is the Paris Agreement going to deliver what the science says is needed? Short answer, no. The world isn't ready to make the kind of emergency commitment that Glenn was talking about. Individuals might be sure. Maybe some countries, maybe the odd one. Uh, a lot of the Smile Island states that are already losing land and suffering, they'd probably be willing. And some of them are going to be 100% renewable by 2020. So the agreement in 2015 will be a rolling agreement. So it'll be a five-year agreement in the sense that, yeah, we're going to agree to do this, but we're going to review everything in five years to accelerate. And this is like not a fudge so much as a recognition that many countries aren't yet ready to do a lot and not prepared. And you want to have flexibility because it turns out the European Union's experience has been they can cut emissions a lot faster than they thought they could. So their original target was 20% by 2020, but they achieved that years ago. They're already well over 20%. And they could do 30 easily. Push themselves to 40, that they take a little bit, that would take a push. So, so far, you know, the lesson is it's been easier to cut emissions than most people had anticipated. So that's the reason for the five-year frame. So you can then say, okay, that wasn't so bad. We can go much deeper in terms of cuts for 2030 or 2035. So there's going to be that kind of progression. So that's at the international level. So at the, as it stands, say the last COP in Warsaw, are there first ministers there? In other words, is the president or prime minister of the country at these things? No. It's, it's, again, only a few small countries will have their prime minister uh, or, or their president. So it, does, still, it does not have that kind of focus. So the folks who are actually there negotiating would be some kind of high-level bureaucrat who can't actually make any real decisions that haven't already been predetermined back at the home office, you know, Ottawa or Washington, D.C. So you don't actually have the leader's attention at these things. Copenhagen, yes, because that was the first time there was huge international leader participation. It's, a, it's anticipated that Paris will have that, and certainly New York will have that in September. So there's this new window of focus on climate change. We had it before Copenhagen. It wasn't, wasn't 18 months long, but we now have a new one. It's just starting to build slowly. The Obama administration, for all of their faults, seem seriously committed to act on climate change. Again, not in line with the science. That's still too soon. You know, part of the reason this too soon thing is we can't yet imagine a society that doesn't run on fossil fuel. It's, this is a, probably the biggest failure of human imagination. And the second part we have, making this so difficult, is our democratic systems don't work very well. So we got the two things. We can't actually envision a future that would be fossil fuel free and better. 
And we don't have a democratic system that would help us get there, and help us create that vision. Um, so, that's, so that's why it's a long work in progress. And I know the science, you know, I do a lot of science writing. I know the science isn't waiting for us. But let me end off with a slightly hopeful note. So my son, uh, Derek, who, by the way, is a, now an environmental journalist as well, he uh, was a tour guide, a historical tour guide in Berlin for a number of years. And one of the parts of his tour is about how the wall fell. How, you know, cast your mind back to the days when Germany was split into two different countries. One was a communist country, a communist dictatorship of the worst kind, with a secret police uh, you know, only science fiction writers had ever dreamed about that had one and every third person spying, you know, citizens spying on each other. So literally 30% of the population was spying on each other. I mean, and I've been through their archives with him and all this stuff. It was an incredibly repressive society. And yet it collapsed. How did it collapse? Meetings like this. In churches, people's basements. Um, the government's made meetings illegal. You know, getting together with more than four people was, once they were all family members, was illegal. So that's how people ended up going to church. You know, we're not meeting, we're going to church. I mean, that's how repressive it was. And that, and that, but people continued to do that because they knew things were wrong. They knew their government was not acting in their best interests, which I suppose has a lot of, uh, <clears throat> might echo our current situation here in Canada. So gradually, you know, people talked amongst themselves. You know, clearly it started off as small groups, very small groups, and not in every city. Uh, but it spread. People talk, so this isn't right. We can see this wrong. You know, my gut tells me this is, this is not what they're telling us, my government is telling us. Uh, it can't be right. And so they got together with like-minded folks, slowly but surely, um, built a movement, although it wasn't really a movement. It wasn't a mass demonstration, or very few, because they were brutally repressed whenever they stepped outside of the churches. And yet, no one expected the wall to fall when it did. It was just a small little strange incident, some miscommunication within the government that allowed one of the gateways in the wall to open and people flooded through. So the, 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 the lesson there is you never know when it's going to change, but it takes work and preparation to make it happen. And then one time, sort of like a flood, you know, with a little leak in a, in a dike, suddenly everything just opens up wide. What's frustrating for all of us here is you don't know where we are. Are we at the crest of the flood or are we just still just slowly, slowly starting to uh, raise the level? I mean, I meet a lot of people who are active in the climate movement all around the world. Lots of young people. Um, I mean, I, so, so in a way I have a kind of a, nar a narrow view because I don't spend enough time uh, dealing with folks who um, aren't involved. But I did run for uh, federal office, like for MP a couple times. And that part of it was to say, well, what do regular Canadians think about these issues? And you know, most of them are aware and are concerned, don't know what to do about it, and there's no leadership. So I think there is that base already there. There are people interested, these small little groups of people who can become active or start talking to each other. That, that potential exists already, and it's happening in many, many places. So what we do, we do what we can. You know, the, my, my favorite poem or phrase from a poem that helps me continue to uh, not burn out uh, is, the world is on fire. There is only time enough to love. So I interpret that as we just do what we can do. And one of those things is talking to folks who are not already inside the circle, talking to strangers and being patient and tolerant and not critical 
and trying to, you know, open up that door of conversation one to one because that's how these things change. I, mean, I could say other things about the media, but I think that's the real uh, source of change: is the one to one personal connections with other people and bringing them slowly into the fold, or just putting the thought in their mind and they can find their own way. There's lots of information out there. It's not a lot of it's bad, but there's a lot of good information out there. So people just need sometimes just a bit of a nudge and, and, and some assurance that you're not the only one who thinks things are not right. You can feel it in your own gut. This is the way we're going is wrong. We need to change. So sometimes folks just need a little helping hand. So thank you guys for coming out.